Hello, welcome to the process. My name is John Bush, Dr. John Bush. Uh, winning your fantasy football drafts is my textbook. I try to update every year on Kindle. Uh, I see fantasy football and the learning and the education that we all need as a process. And so that's why I wanted to uh, present these lectures in a uh, voiceover PowerPoint format. Uh, I really don't think the best way to receive our information is through watching people on a screen talk to us. Okay. Uh, I believe PowerPoints and voiceover is the way to go. You can look at this and come back to it. Uh, this is a block of material kind of thinking about the thinking, uh, dealing with the uh, personality traits, temperament, biases, the, the psychological aspects of fantasy football and trying to win your league. Uh, this is, uh, let's call it lesson four. Uh, we uh, are subject to biases in our decisions okay there's no doubt about that uh, don't think you're a below average most likely you're not uh, a guy named dr. Dennis Foles discussed that when people process their information they develop strategies or biases that simplify their decisions basically he's talking about heuristics and drafting in fantasy football is such a process and people use heuristics all the time and we will develop biases to deal with that. He wrote an article, Rapid Fire Reasoning, uh, military leaders making better decisions under pressure. I think we all want to do that. <clears throat> So cognitive dissonance is a concept we need to discuss as well in dealing with uh, our processing of information during a draft. It is the mental discomfort, the stress, when we try to hold uh, beliefs, ideas, and values that are contradictory in nature. Uh, it's triggered where what you're thinking clashes with new evidence that might be out there. So when we're preparing for our drafts, we're going to get a lot of cognitive dissonance because there's going to be a lot of different takes and information rolling, certainly by the summer. And we're going to deal with that. And, uh, we all strive for internal consistency and that's part of it i think that consistency is a trap by itself and we try to make changes to justify uh dealing with this stress we feel like all oh, this too much thinking let me pick this or let me do that you're kind of giving up there uh I think to lower your stress, we should consider adding new parts, new information, uh, or we avoid contradictory data information that is going to stress us. So I just ignore it. I'm not worried about that. I always draft a quarterback. So you've got that going too, that it's stressful to deal with new information and 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 some people process things better than others. Okay, that's the whole point of hopefully my lessons to at least get you to be aware of that. So fantasy is filled, fantasy football is filled with uh, contradictory ideas. I mean, that's why those that can deal with that probably do better than those who can't. And we are all motivated to lower the stress. 
I want to quickly figure it out and move on. Uh, so we justify and make changes to justify this stress. We should search for more data, should we? Can you find the solution? Is this too quick? Is a quick solution the best solution? Uh, if you're already staked your claim, planted your flag, you hear that. Uh, if we, if there's some contrary, contrarian evidence, do you deal with that or just ignore it? I think this is the bullet point is the key here. Yeah, I have my little pointer thing here. Uh, we need to hold these alternative ideas for longer and try to live with the stress, the dissonance. I think we'll do better if we do that. But you need to be aware that that feeling that I'm tired, I'm tired of dealing with it kind of feeling can cost you. So you're going to have to deal with it if you want to try to move forward in trying to do better drafting. So I think when people are in education, we try to figure out ways where learners can satisfy their need to resolve this and increase the deep processing of the content. And that's the whole point of what I'm trying to do here is uh, I enjoy trying to increase processing for my students. You're listening so you would be considered my student. Uh, just something I've been doing for 30, 40 years. Okay, uh, you know, I've, I get a paycheck, I work at a university. There's no riches and rewards for doing this, just something I enjoy doing. It does help me in the fact that it makes me try to be better. And so by helping you, it actually helps me. So, you know, it's not all altruism here by any means. So we probably should, when we're dealing with the stress, this dissonance, that feeling that we have, uh, we should try to get multiple data streams going. So that's always a key in fantasy football is the information part of the same knowledge or is it something different so is there a correlation and in stats people do principal component analysis and i've done that as well for fantasy football i've got a lecture coming up on it where i broke down variables in some data and tried to use statistical analysis the PCA principal component analysis to group variables as to independent of each other or dependent I think a lot of the information that we get is pretty much a slice of the same thing so that's probably not helpful it's best when you tease out a system is to try to find everything that's as independent from each other as possible to get a measure on the whole system. So this is systems analysis, and it's not something humans do easily. And you, unless you've been trained in data science, you probably haven't done a lot of this. So. When I say dig into multiple data streams, I'm assuming within those streams are aspects that are independent of each other. You need to 
determine in your process where that's at for you. I propose, and in my articles during the season, and in my textbook, I use landscape views. Okay, landscape views, so it's a top-down approach. I don't see a lot of that out there. Okay, some. And I suspect there's more, but since there's so much money involved in daily fantasy, I believe the groups and uh, the syndicates, the betting syndicates, as it were, are probably not advertising their models and uh, their data streams. So I'm not sure. It's kind of like the unknown unknown. I, I think there's things out there, but I'm not sure they're available unless you're parties to that. If there's millions of dollars on the table, especially in daily fantasy sports, you can assume there are groups that are have teams of people doing the stats, the analysis, just not sure we hear about them because knowledge that is scarce tends to be more valuable than knowledge that everybody knows. That, that works in any kind of information-based gambling, okay, sports gambling, horse racing, these kind of things. So I like to look at the top-down approach, team usages, success, failures, players looking downward. I try to use the metrics that revealed a grand aspect of a team. Is the team fast or slow in their activities? You know, snaps per minute. Okay. Do they do more rushing or passing? Or kind of are they balanced? Do they use wide receivers over running backs or the reverse? Do they heavily depend on tight ends? That's the kind of general information. If you get too deep quickly and start bottom up, you forget that it's a system game, okay? It's not only a system game, it's a weekly game because there's a new process that happens every week. Game plans, scripts, two systems come together and we don't get to see a lot of that so the the replications of the data it's hard to get a, a big sample size i like to generate visuals to imagine the game scripts in the future looking at pecking orders of teams and how good their players are their offense their defense I think only then coming down into the layers should players be, you know, seriously ranked at that point. And I'm not sure groupings are not better than rankings. There's, there's this debate out there. I like to also include uncertainty levels. If you'll look at my seasonal, I will rank players, but I will acknowledge what I can high level of uncertainty, middle or low level of uncertainty about that player's rank. I try to think about injuries and their effects coming into a season and weekly. What's going to happen? A lot of people scramble really quickly myself included. Okay, who's the next person up if there's an injury? Got really tough with during the last year with the with the COVID. You're going to be dealing with contradictory information and that's actually going to increase your level of stress. Fantasy football drafting if you're doing it multiple times and you're trying to do it in a serious approach is going to be very stressful and you need to realize that it's not just something you can stumble around and you know hit something 
it's you, you've got to set the table. You chop your wood, then you get the fire. The more stress you feel, the more you probably should dig. And again, looking for independent streams of data. That's a key element here. Okay, so a book I would uh, suggest ever everyone look at that's listening. Think uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kamen. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in Behavioral Economics, or I'm not sure, economics maybe, but he does behavioral economics. Okay, and I think that applies to fantasy football drafting. If you think of our draft capital as money, then we have to deal with our money. So our thinking capacity, he proposes, uh, we have two functional systems, how we deal with decisions under uncertainty. He calls them systems one and two. System one is our fast and frugal, and it dominates our system two, which is deep, logical thinking. Okay, that's bullet point one. As a biologist in evolution, I think the fast and frugal is probably what got our ancestors through situations. In other words, when the leaves are shaken or the weeds are moving, you need to jump up a tree. You don't have time to go looking. What is that? Well, if it's a predator, you're eaten. So I think our fast and frugal fight or flight thinking is our knee jerk. I think you see that in the stock market all the time. It's been a lot of, uh, done a lot of research on that myself. Uh, people react non-rationally. Okay. If you've invested in the stock market, you know people react and overreact. And we do that in fantasy football. That's our system one. That's my puppy dog. System two is lazy, but it is where we really put things together. We get our deep thinking. We're hardwired in fantasy football processing that our system one pops up. It's the first thing. We read a quick little blurb and here we go. We don't take the time to think deeper. System one marinates our thinking in the sea of cognitive biases. Isn't that good? Yeah. And we fail to realize that, okay? That last sentence is, is my, my sentence there. I, I like that. That's what I think. I think everybody percolates in their system one thinking. By going landscape and top down, using my textbook, using my approaches, it enables me, and I hope you, but me, to try to tap into my system one. So system one maintains and updates our model of how we perceive the world and what is normal and right. When system two is engaged, so go back on that. When system two is otherwise engaged, in other words, it's not focusing on the world we believe anything, almost anything. System one is gullible and it's biased to believe quickly and do something, even if it's the wrong thing. Horses will run back into a burning building. 
That's their system one. System two is in charge of your doubting and unbelieving. So unbelieving and doubting is a good thing, but system two is busy and tends to be lazy. So what we really need in our fantasy drafts, it stays hidden and it's lazy and it's harder to bring it forth. So understand your statement must begin with trying to believe it. You must first know the idea means if it were true. Only then should you unbelieve it or not. The initial attempt to believe it is system one. Unbelieving is system two. So what we deal with in the order is we believe it. Oh, everybody says whatever. That's the believing. We have to work hard to walk around that. You see the order there. So when you see ADP, that's kind of the system one's view of things. We have to go in and fight that view with our system two. So that's, you need to be thinking about that as you go into the drafts. Not saying that ADPs are not good. Wisdom of the crowds can perform really well until they don't. <laughs> to us, not right. So I made this up thinking about system one and two. So let me just kind of read through this and comment. System one thinking in fantasy football, it's fast. So in time draft, you don't have a lot of time, what's going to predominate system one? You're going to be quick thinking shortcuts. You see a pattern, you blink the pattern and you do something. Storytelling, it easily connects you to perceived cause and effect. System one, can help us think of the big picture and best use for routine picks and sure things. Sometimes if the ADP is right, then you don't need to unbelieve it. The whole point of getting ready for your draft is thinking about where it's squishy, where the ADP is squishy. So you don't need to spend time if it's, if you know, if you're thinking that it is real. But the flip side, down on the third quadrant down, jumps into wrong conclusions. Uh, and that's really bad in time drafts. You don't have a lot of time to consider that. We don't know what we don't know, and we're very blind with our system one. And if we don't put some breaks to system one, then we're going to be under the spell of biases. We will not understand that there's information is missing. We don't see the missing information. We're blind to it. Low informations, that's what fantasy is in a lot of ways. We don't have a lot of information. Let's say this, a lot of unrelated pieces of the puzzle. We have a lot of probably the same thing over and over said different ways, people spouting the same things. 20 parrots saying the same thing basically. It's easy to stay in the crowd's thinking. It's comfortable to jump, uh, stay in the ADP range. Everybody knows that's smart. It's hard to walk away against the crowd sometimes. System two thinking, however, so that was system one. System two, it's slow and deliberate, deeper thinking, logical, abstract thinking. That all sounds great. We want that. It allows us to weigh pros and cons of a player. It uses stats to make decisions for us. 
it breaks down the flimsy stories and models that are flipped up straw men by the pundits, the talking heads, as it were. Their stories are flabby and flimsy. Okay. It rejects the commonplace. Everybody knows that. System two allows you to unbelieve. Slow and hard to use though. You get scission fatigue in fantasy football drafts. Tired, I, you don't think so, that's true. It has been shown in people making a lot of decisions in a short amount of time that giving those individuals glucose favored drinks and those that are not with glucose, the brain uses lots of energy in the form of sugar, that's what drives our glycolysis, okay, our cellular energy, okay, if you know about basic biology and glycolysis, it is scary to use because you're going to be out there on the wire by yourself. There's no safety net. System one makes you feel good. Easy. Everybody thinks that. Let me just float on down the draft. You have to move against the crowd at times. You've got to be able to train to see the biases in the minefields. And that's the trickiest thing. Where is the danger? You may not know where you should or shouldn't step, but you know you're in the minefield. That's where we've got to get you guys. Okay, we've got to get you to become one with your system to thinking, and that's tough. There are government agencies, serious investors that also are trying to do the same thing, okay? So that's my view of system one and two. Thank you all to read the book, give you some more information. Getting back to Dr. Fold's research, he thought that there were three big biases when people are doing a lot of information. But he also found that when researchers who were used to dealing with information under pressure, they tended not to have as much error than those that are not trained to deal with large amounts of information. So his take home for military leaders is, and ours for fantasy Subjects who were trained to spot conditions that lead to biases were better at finding false alarm opportunities. System one traps. Dealing with a large amount of information, you're going to be able to fight the system one, the trap it's throwing to you. It's hardwired in us, just believe it. Trained to spot. So I'm hoping that these lessons, the textbook, my articles help you spot those traps. I think it helps me. It's not perfect. We're not 100%, but that's where we're going with, with this. So I'm spending the time try to help myself and help you along the way training. So I propose in fantasy, if you practice thinking about the data positions league, where are you weak at? You must know in system one where the minefields are. What are the conditions where the decisions just seem too easy and good? They just flow right off. In fact, the easier it seems, you probably you should slow down and let system two work for you. That should really be a problem when you just kind of start floating through it. Like, boy, this is coming too easy to me. Groups will do better as they are slower to decide why individuals are too quick and surf the fantasy football data waves with their system one trap reasoning. So, it would be to everybody's advantage to develop groups 
to help make decisions in drug. If I was risking a lot of money, I would want to have groups. I'm not here to be, look what I did. Uh, I'm here to make some money. And if it was serious money, I would try to get people who have talent that I don't have. I would be forming that. I'll say this, sometimes the minority report is the way to go. So if you have a group, it's best to see what the minority of that group are saying about the situation. What are they seeing that everybody else is missing? That group think. So if you listen and work too many podcasts, I think you get marinated with all the group think. I don't watch and listen to a lot of podcasts. I'm going to be just straight up. Okay. I think and work and do my journey. So when you slow down, you must dig up or conceptualize a view of the player, the pick, it breaks the system. System one is wanting to maintain the easy thinking. System two tries to unbelieve. What data evidence exists to unbelieve the model, i.e. unbelieve the ADP? I'm picking somebody up off the waiver. Is this false alarm? Maybe some people do better writing it out, walk away, and then come back and read it again. Why am I doing this? I know we don't have time. Well, if you can perceive beforehand, and I, I've written some articles where I do kind of what if scenarios, if this player is injured, what does that mean? ADP can help, but not always. Sometimes there are hidden players on practice squads, etc., that jump out of nowhere, it happens. So you can do some of that. It is somewhat helpful if you look at ADP and how a whole squad of running backs, wide receivers are ranked, you might be able to perceive who's going to move up in the event of injury. Certainly with best ball playing that I enjoy a lot, I use that probably a lot more. Probably should use that more in my redrafting too. But anyway, I do spend time thinking about pecking orders like that. So system one, the strongest where the information is the least because it's easy. There's nothing there. Everybody, there. Everybody's seeing the same few bits of things. And so that system one wants to jump to conclusions. What do I need to know before I imagine that player's ranking? That's a good question. What do I need to know? Okay. So look at your data and determine the amount of information. Where it's the weakest at? Where is your information weak? Where's it flimsy? Where's it flabby? Those are where you're in the minefield. False alarm opportunities, Dr. Foe would say. System one minefields, Dr. Kahneman would say. Okay, think about that. So these are some things that I consider when a player is switching teams. That's a minefield. We tend to want to think players behave like they did in the previous team. Things can be completely different. Running backs by committee. That can get real murky quick. You've heard the old hot hand. Nobody likes the hot hand. New coach or a new system being tried. That's by nature going to be the weak information. Rookie players drafted. How are they fitting in? Competitions between players. 
So in redraft leads, those are things I try to make note of, especially early on in the draft. You need to start, even if you don't have the answer, at least be aware of it. Hey, there's a new coach over here. Don't know what the means. Maybe some people do out there. If somebody's reliable, then maybe they can give you an insight. In dynasty leagues, when you're doing rookie drafts, at least the one I'm in, we have actually have to cut players to make room for new players every year. Who do I drop, right? The sunk cost fallacy, right? Well, I invested whatever last year. I can't get rid of them. They might do good this year, maybe. <laughs> okay. Notice I said might and maybe. Okay. How long do you hold on to an underwhelming player? Sunk cost fallacy. Look that up. How do you evaluate a fair trade? Fair, fair value in a trade. Who are you dealing with that way? How do you rebuild in an aging roster? What do you do first? You've been stuck in the middle. How do you clear that next hurdle? What do you need to do? Those are all examples in dynasty leagues of minefields where you might be subjected to lots of system one traps, false alarm opportunities. Think about that. So I hope I've given you some more deeper thinking, thinking about thinking, decisions under uncertainty, big ideas here for fantasy drafts. Continue, come back, study, be a scholar. It's what I want you to be. Okay, uh, that's all for lesson four. Come back. We'll have lesson five coming up.